Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome along. Uh, it's good to see you all coming in. I have put a little bit of a link to a quick survey there for you uh, in the chat. Folks, just while we're giving another minute or so for any others to arrive, if you haven't already gone in and completed that, uh, you can have a quick look in and you can also get a chance to see us watching on the map as we appear in real time. So I'll give just a few moments for those of you who haven't had a chance to complete it yet to do so, because we're actually going to start with using that map, because here's my cunning plan. I have already got you using GIS, even though some of you may not have even realized it. And you, you know the way when you come to a session like this, it's always great to have some takeaways, some easy things that you can use in your classroom. Well, this is one of those. Uh, and I'm going to give you right at the start a very, very simple, and easy thing that you can do with any of your pupils that really is quite a lot of fun. So I am going to go to the screen share here um, in just a moment. A couple of, of quick housekeeping things just to begin with. Um, once I go to screen share with this, uh, I can't see the chat. So I've asked Brendan Conway and Andy Funnell, who are good GIS buddies of mine, to just keep an eye on there. So if there's any questions that come through at any stage, um, they're hopefully going to be able to answer them and, and send some my way if um, they really are urgent at that stage. But at, once I screen share, I'm not going to be able to see what you're typing. Now, the reason why I'm going to screen share is because I've been mad enough not to do this via static PowerPoint presentation. Oh no, we're going to live demo the GIS software right now in this session. Um, there's absolutely no point in me saying that GIS is a wonderful tool for teaching without me using GIS. I thought that was a brilliant idea. And then on Good Friday, this happened. I had a little bit of a fall and I managed to broke, uh, break my hand. So I'm now one handed. <laughs> so I'm not only going to try and live demo this software in front of you all, I'm going to try and do it with one hand only. This is surely complete madness. So um, I was going to say that uh, we need to keep my fingers crossed, but seeing as I can't quite cross my fingers, uh, you'll have to do it on my behalf. Uh, so wish me luck and hopefully, well, let's just say if I manage to get through this to the end, doing it one handed, <laughs> we can surely use this in our classroom, can't we? So here we go. Screen share time. And uh, the first thing I need to do, because this software is entirely new to me, is the inevitable. Are you seeing my screen with this? So if I could get one of the guys just to send me a wee message, uh, just to confirm. Um, yeah, all good. Thanks, Andy. Right, here we go. This is where we're all coming from at the moment. Uh, so this is you having already used GIS. It's a little survey one, two, three, and it populates where we're all coming from. And we can see that uh, most of us are teachers. There's a few in that category of other as well. But there you go. This is this is cool. You, you can use this right from the offset. But what I want to do is to show you something that is a little strategy that I use with my pupils whenever we're looking at locations of earthquakes or volcanoes in the world. So we can do something like who is furthest away, who has come from the furthest location. So we have somebody down here, Mandy from Zurich, from Switzerland. Very, very welcome uh, over here in East Germany, Harriet. Very welcome as well. But the big question is not how close are you to the UK, but the exciting question we want to ask our pupils is how close have you ever been to a volcano? So imagine with me that you have set up a survey quite like this, but it's not where are you now, it's where have you been on holiday? And maybe you want to give them a few choices around the world and they complete the survey like that and it appears in a map like this. And the question that you want to say to them is how close have you been to a volcano? Well, all we have to do is go in here and search for World Volcanoes. And it will bring in the World Volcanoes for us. And this layer will appear. So if I zoom out, 
we can see who is actually closest to the volcanoes at the moment. So, I reckon if we come down here, um, Mandy, you're you're absolutely very close to some of those exciting volcanoes that are going um, are having some activity down in Italy. We can see that you are um, nearly 600 kilometers away there from. Oh, what about Vesuvius? If we come down here to um, Etna, good news, you're over 12,000 kilometers away from Etna. What about the volcano that's happening in Iceland at the moment at the Reykjanes uh, Peninsula? All right, okay, so we do have a little bit of a competition here. Um, this is Andy. Yep, Andy, there you are. Uh, somebody's joined us from Edinburgh. Who's this? Rachel. Uh, hello, very welcome, Rachel. So let's see who's going to be closest um, to the volcano in Reckonish Peninsula at the moment. Uh, Andy, you're a little bit closer than me. Rachel, you're a little bit further away. So, Andy, you're the one that's closest. So, if you fancy a quick field trip over to Iceland to see that, that's you're definitely getting a bit of a head start. Well, there you go, folks. That's just a very, very simple little introduction to how you can very, very easily use ArcGIS as a, a, a wonderful, simple, yet powerful teach from the front tool with your pupils. Okay, let's come in, however, to the presentation itself. And the title, of course, is the rather cryptic, uh, well, we'll come to the, the name of the place in a moment. But the whole notion here is what I want to do is just to show you some of the things that I've been doing over the past year, which help me to really contextualize the geography that I'm studying with the pupils very much into place. So that this isn't just a, a random theoretical subject that we're studying, but it's something that's very much grounded in the ground and the reality of the world around us. So space and place, of course, you're very, very used to those as geographical concepts. Place is space with some sense of meaning uh, or association attached to it. So a quick game of place word association. As I say, I can't see the chat, so um, you can feel free to type this in the chat if you want. So I say New York, you say? Empire State Building, uh, Macy's, whatever. This one. <laughs> okay, um, thanks to the images coming from Belfast over the last few days. Perhaps when I say Belfast, the images that come to mind are particular and uh, perhaps involve a few petrol bombs and things like that. Uh, so without getting into the politics of that at all today, because that's not what we're here about, can I show you something else about Belfast that shows you what Belfast means to me? Uh, this is Cave Hill in Belfast. I love to go up to the top of Cave Hill. There is the city of Belfast down below. The views that you can get from up there, listening to the life of the city coming um, up from you, wafting up, especially whenever the snow is dusted over the landscape. It's absolutely beautiful. Now, if you've never been to Belfast, you don't have that sense of place that I do. What about this? Here's the famous word in the title. Now, if you have heard me do a version of this presentation before, you should be able to pronounce this. You're all having a go at that now, I hope, aren't you? Yeah, you have to. So, the locals refer to this as this is Les Naganya. Les Naganya. Which is probably not what you were expecting. I say listen again you to you and you probably have no idea, no notion to uh, in your head at all of what it means. However, if you have ever been to the north coast of Northern Ireland to the sublime Causeway coast, you will have probably driven through listen again you. It's a little hamlet between Bush Mills and Bally Castle. Um, and you'll drive through it, um, but probably not even have noticed. Now, why am I talking about Les Nagunya in a presentation about GIS? Because what I want to start off by exploring with this is this sense of place that, that we should be trying to build with our pupils, but perhaps we struggle to at times. So if I say to you, Les Nagunya, and you have very little conception of what that might mean, I wonder how many of our pupils have a similar response when we say things like, Folks, we're going to study Typhoon Haiyan. Of course, you can present notes to them in an exam-friendly format. 
Students go and learn those, repeat that in the exam, they'll score extremely well. Very good exam technique, but absolutely awful geography because there's no sense of place whatsoever. So I'm going to start off today by showing you how I've used GIS to give that sense of place for my students for Typhoon Haiyan. This sits in the sequence of lessons of we've already studied the impacts of typhoons. So this is generative knowledge and generative learning in the sense that they're doing something with it. They're making meaning from it, but they're not making it up. There is a, a knowledge foundation that they're moving on from. And I'm going to take you into um, the map that we use for this. And this is the slides I use to guide them through. So how can we use Typhoon or GIS to turn Typhoon Haiyan from uh, space into place? Okay, so what you can see here is the map in front of me. Now, because I've just changed the tab, I'm and I haven't used this software before. I'm going to right. Let me just go back one here so that you can you can see, uh, and I'll turn that image on again. So you're seeing here the effect of the storm damage, the north south variation, and the east west variation that's taking place there. Um, and you can get the pupils to explore those. But we can come in a little bit closer again and look at the effect that the storm surge has had. If I turn on this layer, the storm surge layer is represented by these proportional circles. Again, an interesting hypothesis. What are the spatial patterns that the pupils are seeing here? What is the relationship? between these, the distance from the center of the storm and the damage. And you can see that the storm surge damages and heights are, are greatest closer to the center of the storm, but not exclusively so. Because if you click on this one, the height here is 4.1 meters, but this catches my eye. Up here, further to the north, you're also getting something very high. And this is where the power of the GIS comes in, because you can allow your students then to go in and explore that. Now, what is it about this location that might have made the storm surge higher? What a fascinating question to get your pupils to consider. Of course, one of the main things will be the uh, the shape of the coastline here, funneling it in, causing the wave height to increase. But because you're able to go in and explore those, you're able to see that which would maybe otherwise just be something that was curious to you. Why is it so big up here? Well, I don't know. With the power of GIS, you can go in and have a look. Talking of storm surges, of course, if you've done this case study, you will know that Tackleban City was one of the areas that was affected most by this. So we can come in and have a really close look at Tackleban City itself. If I turn on the legend here, you'll see that these are buildings that are damaged and collapsed. What are the patterns that are apparent here? What are the relationships, say, between topography of the land and damage? What are the relationship between distance from the sea and damage? But we can go in even further than that, which brings me to a wonderful experience I had the first time I used this with six formers, because I had been looking with them about distance from the sea and the damage. One of the boys called me over and said this, Mr. Hummel, I'm just noticing here that these um, collapsed buildings are all mostly a lot smaller. The buildings that are damaged seem to be the bigger damage or the bigger buildings. I said to him, you're right. I hadn't even noticed that. So what we did then was went on to Google Earth. I went in here to Street View and had a look and I realized actually, of course, these were most of the, the more sandy town type buildings, the poorer quality buildings, which were closer to the ocean, less well constructed and much, much more vulnerable to damage. But what we discovered with that or what I discovered with that is that giving my pupils the ability to come in and look at these things for themselves and to explore these things for themselves gives them the ability to use and apply their knowledge and to spot things that perhaps I as a teacher didn't even spot myself. So if we come back into the presentation, uh, what the students got from this then is the um, the sense of the scale. They were able to look at that from the world scale right down to the, the sense of the, the streets. They were able to look for those patterns as they went through exploring the relationships there, the distributions that are happening here. And it gives them what I refer to as a scaffolded freedom. I should say, folks, that I will share this presentation with you at the end. I've put some additional text on here to make it more um, sensible for you when you're reading it uh, yourself. I'm not going to read the screen to you 
uh, as we go through now, but it's that scaffolded freedom to access the powerful knowledge that they can go and apply and analyze these patterns and see the things that are going on there. And the scaffolded freedom also enables them to do that generative knowledge that they are paying careful attention and guiding them in, as to what to pay attention to in the map. But they are then looking at that and they are thinking, they're organizing and making sense of that information, integrating it into what they already know and really enriching their knowledge schema as they move through that whole process. So there's one example. What I really want to do now is just to give you a little bit of the theory uh, underpinning my approach to using GIS and then the rest of our time will just be me packing in as many examples of how I use it as I possibly can. And I want to start off with um, a, a model that I've, I've devised which I, I hope is helpful in getting us to think about any kind of ICT use but certainly with, with GIS. With any kind of GIS use, we need to have a very clear pedagogical intent. Why is it that we want to do what we're going to do with this? It, there is an argument that says that, that that students should use and learn GIS just as an end in itself. It's a very, very powerful tool. But in the busyness of a packed curriculum with exams coming up, we have that very core um, priority that we need to do. This needs to add to their geographical knowledge and understanding. But what very often happens whenever we say, right, okay, fair enough, GIS I think can add to this. Right, how do we do it? And what then happens is we jump into what I would call the procedural knowledge, where we go into that step by step, click this, click that, click the other. And the problem with the procedural knowledge is that if you don't have it, if it's not well developed, you can get so engrossed in there. What do I need to click? What do I need to switch? What do I need to turn? That very often the pedagogical intent can get lost. And similarly with our pupils, if it is all about procedure, click this, turn that off, change this, that, the other. If it's all about that, then what they're thinking about is the procedure and not the geography. So what I want to demonstrate to you as we go through is that uh, how, how can we make this procedural knowledge accessible, both for you as a teacher and for the pupils? How do we make it so that the focus is very much in the learning and the geography? And part of the way that I want to do that is by covering a third type of knowledge with you, uh, because I'll, I'll show you bits and pieces of procedural knowledge as we go through this. But the main focus here is actually going to be on the know why and what I would call the know what. If you know what the GIS can reasonably be expected to do, then in my experience, that's where the interesting thinking and planning happens. Oh, so you can do that with the GIS. Right, well, if you can do that with the GIS, then maybe I can get the pupils to do this. And for me, it's the dialogue between these two, which is where the really interesting thinking and learning and teaching ideas come. Because once you start to get those two clear in your mind, the know why and the know what, then thankfully we are in a very helpful and sharing geography community where there'll always be people that will help you with the procedural knowledge. Um, in actual fact, that's the easy bit to get. Um, these are the more challenging bits. So you will get a few wee bits of procedural knowledge in the way through here, sure. But I want you to focus more on thinking to yourself, right, is this going to enhance my teaching and learning? Is this going to be, enable better geography? And also for me to give you an indication of what the GIS can do that might help. That's really where I would love your thinking to be. Okay, so we need a wee bit of procedural knowledge to move forward, don't we? Yes, well... That's true. So let me break that down into two sub elements. Constructing GIS. That's not what this is about today. There are loads of resources pre made, readily available. And when I share this presentation with you at the end, you'll get access to all of the maps that I'm going to show you. You'll be able to play away with those and have a lot of fun, I hope, with them as well. The know how really more is along the lines of using the GIS. And the good news I have for you is that the on-ramp for using GIS to get to good geography quickly is very, very gentle. I purposely wanted to start off with that map with you today to show you how you could get a really easy win. And the on-ramp for using this is very, very simple. Okay, so the first thing that I want to look with you here is how we use what I'm calling a digital workbook 
to manage the cognitive load uh, with the pupils because if we've talked about that procedural knowledge um, very often it can be a little bit overwhelming whenever you're giving people step after step after step of what to follow so how have I tried to get around it well here's a little example I want to show you from something that I did based on earthquakes with my pupils what I set up for them here was uh, a map uh, or this was in their original uh, textbook, I should say, or in their, their notebook, uh, which was a map that was allowing them to explore the pattern of earthquakes. Oh, yeah. This map was limited in many ways. The, the data was very frozen in time. Uh, you can't correlate the map uh, locations with any other factors. Looking at North America there, are those hazards all the same size? What's this over here in Hawaii, an interesting anomaly? Um, can we zoom in and have a look at that? No, we can't. And all we get here is the location of it. It's a very, very static map. So I really wanted my pupils to go further with that and explore that global pattern. And this is the overview that I gave them of this digital jotter. I'll share this with you at the end. But I want you to notice a few things about this, of how I designed this in order to support the pupils as they're using it. In order to try and manage the cognitive load, I've kept the design of each of these very, very similar. So whenever the pupils are looking, Looking at the slide, it looks very similar to what they've seen before. They're not presented with something that's shockingly new and different, and they very quickly get into the, the hang of using these things. I've kept the instructions very, very bite-sized, and then room for them to type in their answers, because I want this to be very interactive, and I want them to be able to refer to the instructions that I'm giving them as they're typing. Because this is done in Google Slides, they all get a copy shared with themselves and then they can submit this to me as an individual copy in Google Classroom at the end and I can go through and have a little bit of a look at what they're doing. So let me show you some of the things that we're able to do with this. So here first of all is my version of the map that appeared in their books and you can see that in the first instance this looks similar but the first thing that I've done here is to make these um, proportional to the size of the earthquake so you can see very much that uh, is related there sorry I just need to take a wee filter off here quickly from where I was practicing earlier and this will draw this back down again yes and there's the earthquake pattern and distribution coming in just taking a few moments to draw that down Okay, so I, what I can do is set up the um, bookmarks for this. And again, these are linked into the uh, places in their digital jotter. So go to bookmark two, South America. Here we are in bookmark two in South America. And the question here in many ways is very, very simple, is to describe in detail the distribution here across South America. So what I did was train them in how they would go about describing distributions. So this is what this little map here is for where things are and where they aren't and giving them some terms that they can use, regular, concentrated, linear, circular, those kinds of things. So they can pull out some information from this relatively easily. And of course, because this is a GIS map, we can turn this on and they can correlate that and relate that to the location of the plate margins. So that's a very, very simple exercise for them. Then what I tend to do is to move it on a little bit more complex and a little bit more challenging for them as we go through. I'll just open up the, the actual uh, digital jotter here for you so you can see a little bit more clearly what I'm asking them to do here for North America. To what extent are the earthquakes here concentrated along the west coast? So you can see that I'm moving up in challenge from the previous one, which is just to describe the distribution. To what extent are they concentrated along the west coast? Um, because everybody knows earthquakes occur in California. Oh, or do they? To what extent? A more challenging question. But what I can then get them to do in the next one is to break this down a little bit more because, right, well, what, if it, what if we wanted to filter this by earthquake size a little bit more? What if we wanted to look at where the big earthquakes were? How do we go about doing that? Very, very simple. Now, this is the procedural knowledge that I guide them through. And you can see from this step by step how relatively easy this would be. I want them to choose magnitude from that drop down menu. I want a magnitude greater than, 
and I want them to choose a value, five. That's the procedural knowledge. Now, the way I've presented it to them in the Google Slides means that it's very, very accessible. Apply filter, and lo and behold, ah, yes, that pattern is much more along the lines of what you might expect. Now, there's all sorts of interesting geography you could go on and explore from there. What is it that causes those other earthquakes? What is it that causes the um, intraplate earthquakes? Um, what's that tell us about the legacy of North America's tectonic history? All sorts of things like that. But there's a very simple little exercise that you can do to get them to um, do that to what extent exercise. And then what I like to do is to take them in as I'm doing something in the end here is to really allow them that little bit more freedom towards the end. Right. What if we were to take one day of earthquakes? OK, so we're moving away beyond just that simple earthquakes occur near plate boundaries. Where do you see the powerful geography that you can release on this one? So the first thing that I got them to do is to go into this bookmark five then six showing Alaska. Um, so if we come back into this map, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. I'm going to turn on just that one day of earthquakes. I'll turn off the other ones. There's one day's worth of earthquakes across the world. And already we're seeing something that catches our eye here up in Alaska, aren't we? So let's go in a little bit closer. If you remember what happened in the 19th of October 2020, you'll remember this well. Give them an Alaska overview. I can change the base map for this one as well to the imagery base map to give them a bit more of a sense of the place here. Uh, so what we can see here is where these earthquakes are occurring in relation to Alaska. And then I can come in much, much closer. And what I have then is this little cluster of earthquakes that occurred on that day in Alaska. So what's the task that I'm asking them to do? Well, I'm actually ultimately going to move them towards a, a powerful question here. This earthquake, if you remember, it was a really big one, a magnitude 7.6 earthquake and yet minimal damage uh, injuries and no deaths. How does such a big earthquake mean that there was such little damage? It's an interesting, powerful question. To support and guide them towards that, what I'm able to do is to get them to go and collect some information, some data collection from this map. So we're going to take a look at some from Alaska and we're going to take a look at some from California. So let's have a look. Their instruction, again, their procedural knowledge here is simply to go through and uh, find some of these earthquakes, find the, the biggest ones, choose any four and record their magnitude and depth. Um, and in they go and they can start to have a little bit of a look around. They click on there, there's the depth, there's the magnitude. And what my students do, because they've all got a copy of this, they just put that information in there and they start to build up a pattern here, not just of earthquake magnitude, but also earthquake depth, because the shake intensity doesn't just relate to the magnitude, of course, it relates also to the depth. And we can compare that. So if we see here, this big one here was at 32 kilometers deep. Well, is that deep? How deep is 32 kilometers? Well, we need some frame of reference, don't we? So we need to go down to California. And we need to go on and look at some of the earthquakes on here. The depth, 7.37. So once they've filled that in a little bit, they get a bit of an idea of the pattern of how these earthquakes manifest themselves. So we give them some more resources on this and then finished off with this big question, the big final challenging question. Why did such a large earthquake cause such little damage and no deaths or injuries. What a powerful question. Now, remember the example I showed you in Typhoon Haiyan? It's really what prompted this. It's allowing the students to go in and explore this for themselves. So what I've got on here is um, some information about the Alaskan towns. Let's go back up here to Alaska. Here's some information about the Alaskan towns. If I zoom out a little bit, we can see Anchorage. There it goes. A quarter of a million people live there. But most of the other settlements we can refer to the um, the legend here, most of the other settlements are very, very small. So what we can begin to see from this is that, in actual fact, there are not too many people that are living nearby this. If we use our measure tool here to measure the distance, we can see 80 kilometers away. But how many people live in this settlement? None. 
Should we go in and have a look at the settlement where nobody lives? And look at what they're able to do. Yeah, I don't know, an abandoned settlement. They look like there's some old abandoned houses there, but nobody's living there anymore. What about if we come over here? And they can really get a bit of a sense of the sparseness of the population density for people living here. They can come down and have a look at those houses one by one. Why is it that such a big earthquake caused such little damage? Well, you can see the various factors that are coming um, across there. You can see as we look at those that you're looking at things that are related to um, the magnitude of the earthquake yes but also the depth of the earthquake and indeed the population density so just to show you what one of my students this is what he filled in um one of my students uh, the work that he did and i was able just obviously to get this in from all of the students but this is his answer at the end now we're not going to read this all out because uh, uh, i don't have time but if i did you would just be blown away this is a year 10 student and what he managed to find and the geography that this unleashed for him that was so much more than where we started what's the relationship between where you have the earthquakes and the plate margins what they're able then to do as an investigative generative process is so much more powerful through that okay the next one that I want to move on to then, and this is all about trying to kind of manage that procedural knowledge challenge here, is something called hypothesis testing using GIS. How do we overcome the challenge of procedural knowledge when we use GIS? And one of these um, that I want to use an example here is the downstream changes in rivers. So we're all very used to this model, the Bradshaw model of downstream changes in rivers. Um, this is a great graphic in terms of summarizing the changes that we would expect to see, but it is so decontextualized from place. So how do we use GIS to help us with that? Well, here is the next digital jotter. This one is some data collection on a stream, a river in County Antrim, where they're able to go in and have a look at um, the information and how they're going to collect this data. So I can start again using scale very well. I can show them where this is in Northern Ireland. We can come in closer and put on the watershed of the river there. But because this is a scene view, this enables us to do this. All of a sudden, the map becomes a three-dimensional living organic landscape. So we can look up from the mouth of the river. We can come up towards the source looking downstream. And then I can take them in to location by location. And here is some fieldwork data that they can come in and collect. They click on this. There's the data that they can collect. Now, the thing that I always want to say to them is it's not just simply a matter of getting that, uh, clicking on that and, and uh, putting that data into a spreadsheet. This is your opportunity to explore this landscape, to really get a feel for how this landscape looks and feels and what these numbers represent. What would it be like actually to stand in that landscape? And there's one other tool that is very powerful here in the 3D scene viewer, the analyze tool. Because what I can do here is get them to measure the steepness of the valley. Now these orange lines represent the contours. So if I click on here, drag this across, I basically tell them I want you to travel approximately 500 meters from the river and how much altitude have you gained. And they're able to do that going down survey point by survey point, collecting the data, getting the sense of the place and really measuring what those valleys and those uh, the valley looks like and how it changes as it moves downstream. Now, part of the reason why hypothesis testing is useful in terms of managing the cognitive load is that, and I'm sure you've all had this experience if you do a river study in a field trip, that first survey site can be a little bit chaotic, can't it? No matter how much training and preparation you do with them in the classroom in advance, sir, how do I do this? What am I meant to do here? And it's just, you know, it's controlled chaos. <laughs> 
By the time they get to number two, slightly better, three, four, survey site six, my goodness, they are pros. They have nailed it. Now, it may well be the promise of a quick visit to McDonald's for lunch on the way back to school that hurries them up. But because they're repeating the same procedures over and over again, the procedures quickly become secondary and they focus on the geography. There's loads of ways that you can do this with geography of that hypothesis testing. The key is to get the same set of procedures all the way through and gets them focused very much on the geography. Now, what I do in order to help them to collect the data is pre-set up a um, Google Sheets here for them because I've discovered <laughs> that it's much, much more difficult to train my students how to use a spreadsheet than it is to train them how to use a GIS map. Um, the first time I did this, I, I let them loose with this themselves at the spreadsheets. Everything had been going fine up until that point. Then the lesson just collapsed in utter chaos. So I quickly learned from that. And ever since then, I have just pre-populated this. The graphs are in there. Everything is in there. All they need to do is drop the data in. Because what I want them then to do is, and here's the digital jotter mm -hmm. for the students. This is giving them an introduction to that process of geographical inquiry. And uh, this is preempting the field work that we will actually be doing in the landscape and that process inquiry. And I want them then get the quick overview, set your hypotheses to test. So this is one of my students. Again, this is a year 10 student. Um, and you can see here how I am using this hypothesis testing approach to manage the cognitive load. The approach is very much the same. There's the data they collected, the graph, and they copied and pasted in there. And then there's their description. That's river width. There's river depth. Look at how similar they are, very much purposely so, to manage the procedural load so that the thinking is very much related to the geography. Okay, next point is how we bring landscapes to life. This is generative learning. This is pupils that are doing something, thinking about the information through the art of field sketches. Yes, you're going to see some field sketches, some pencil and coloring pencil drawings in the GIS presentation. Now, what my thinking for this came from uh, an image like this. This is what we would call a schematic. Now, schematic is a very, very useful summary diagram that helps the pupils to grasp and understand some of the key elements that you'll find in a river's landscape, or it could be a volcano's landscape, or, or whatever landscape it is. The notion of the schematic is that it simplifies down reality and it shows the overview of the features. It doesn't look anything like reality at all. And interestingly, when I was searching in Google for something on this, I noticed the little um, disclaimer down at the bottom. This is for illustration purposes only. It's not intended as an exact representation. Right? That's almost like the uh, Starbucks, this drink you're about to enjoy is hot warning. Shocker, my goodness, coffee is hot. A schematic isn't an exact representation, but no, it's not. But then part of the challenge, I wonder, is that if we teach our pupils purely theoretically about rivers, what happens when they go and walk around the landscape? If the landscape doesn't look like the schematic, are they actually able to see these things in the landscape? And it reminded me of um, landscape photography. It, it's a very big passion and hobby of mine. Um, Northern Ireland. It, it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. This is the Jans Causeway. I spend a lot of my time there. And what I love about the Jans Causeway is the chaotic nature of all of these columns here. And as a landscape photographer, what you want to do is start to notice order and pattern in the craziness of the landscape. That's what you do as a photographer. You approach the landscape trying to see these patterns. Uh, and I want my pupils to think about that as a geographer too. So I had just finished teaching them river landforms and I really wanted, and this is just during lockdown, by the way, this is doing remote teaching. Uh, I wanted them really to get a sense of what these look like in the landscape. This is a little river valley that's um, about seven or eight miles away from where I live. And I wanted them to build up a sense again of what this looks like in the landscape. So 
ordnance survey maps can impose quite a cognitive load for the students. So I wanted to simplify that down for them, the art of the sketch map of drawing out the bits that are relevant there. But I also wanted them to get a bit of a sense of that in three dimensions. What does the, those contour lines represent in a three dimensional scale? Can we use uh, a sketch map to illustrate that as well? These are the elements that we're building in. So this was all trying to get them to interpret the shape and topography of the landscape based on the map. So I set up um, a GIS map that'll help them with this again, it's using scene viewer. So again, I can start with the overview, let them see where the, this river is uh, in Northern Ireland. We can come in a little bit closer to Glen Oe and this Axel Valley itself. And this is very similar to the OS map that we've just looked at. Can the students see and recognize what that shape is going to look like? And what I'm able to do here is to um, allow them then to explore and move around this in a three dimensional landscape uh, area. This is a particularly interesting location because of the geology of it. Let's come down here. We've got a waterfall coming down here in a moment. Uh, but this is the valley with the geology. Now, I could wax lyrical about the geology of Northern Ireland, particularly after last night's wonderful tour of the Jurassic Coast. But we do have our own uh, Cretaceous chalk. Here's a layer of limestone on top of the mudstone that lies below. But what County Antrim has is a topping on this cake of basalt uh, that was formed 60 million years ago whenever the North Atlantic uh, Igneous province was being formed. And what we have here is a, a slice down through the landscape, courtesy of an ancient fault that runs along here, which meant that this is preferentially eroded. So it's slicing down through the landscape and you can really navigate and look at that. Let's come back out again and get the overview. So what I wanted my students to do, there's the fault coming down there, was to see how all of these elements build together and fit together to produce the river landscapes that we've got here. There's our floodplain. Okay, so why did the floodplain occur here? What was the, the erosion process that, that led to that? Here is our um, waterfall. So we can relate that to the geology, talk to them about uh, waterfalls forming whenever the hard rock overlies the softer rock. Well, there we have our basalt overlying our limestone. So it's no wonder that we've got this vertical fall down here. Uh, and the students were able to go through and explore that. Now, what did they produce as a result of that? Uh, here's some of the sketch maps that they produced. Um, now I guided them through the process of how they might do this. Uh, said to them they could either do it digitally or they could do it using hand-drawn maps. But look at the amount of geographical understanding that that student has demonstrated there. Look at what she has noticed in that landscape. Look at how she's taken her general theoretical schematic of river processes and landforms and applied it into that particular setting. Uh, excuse me if I have a moment of immense pride in my students. They did this at home during remote teaching. So those narratives that are going on saying that our students have fallen behind and that they're the lost generation, absolute, absolute utter nonsense. Well, their challenges, of course, we have to come back, but some of them have done absolutely brilliant work. Um, there's the old hand-drawn one uh, of the art of observation of what they have seen and noticed in this landscape because they've taken that general theoretical stuff and applied it in to the specifics. Okay, I'm going to finish off um, by the theme here is um, comparison and geography. I'm going to finish off by showing you how we can use GIS as a teach from the front tool to tell a compassionate story. All of the work that I've done with you this, this afternoon so far has been physical geography. What about using this for human geography and the theme of migration? Well, I was teaching this to my year 11s um, just before Christmas, so we were still in, in the classroom at the time. And I really wanted to use this GIS map as a teach from the front tool, because you might be looking at this thinking, uh, it's all great, well and good. I can't get access to a computer suite. This is difficult for me. I would love my students to explore those. Um, I think there are ways around those, but 
if that is feels like an insurmountable challenge to you, this is perhaps a way that you can use it, a teach from the front tool. So we start off by looking here at the pattern of net migration. What is the pattern that you see on that map? Is there an east-west pattern? Is there a north-south pattern? And what I'm able to do is to put on a little bit of annotation on the map to show them the pattern that I'm seeing here. Uh, generally speaking, there's a migration loss from Eastern Europe and a migration gain in Western Europe. Why? What are some of the push and pull factors? Well, why don't we consider the GNI per capita? Why don't we put that on? There's our legend again for this. Uh, well, it's no great surprise that we have got a net migration uh, loss from the countries that are poor and a net migration gain from the countries that are richer. But there's already a little bit of an anomaly in here because if I turn on this pattern here, I think there's also a north-south pattern here. I think there definitely is. Um, so what we have is this interesting anomalous region, Spain, Italy, Greece, which are not quite as rich, but yet have a migration gain. So this is where you can ask some really interesting and powerful questions. Why? Why is it that people are moving to Spain? Now, whenever I've got the map set at that location, you can probably guess what the answers are going to be, can't you? Um, they're going to be related to climate and perhaps people retiring to somewhere a little bit warmer, that kind of thing. The migrants from the UK to Spain, expats they're called really migrants, of course, um, moving down into Spain and that kind of thing. But this is where the power of the GIS map can come in because once you change the scale, now remember this is a teach from the front tool. What if I were to look at it not just in Europe, but also Europe and Africa? All of a sudden here, let me just turn a few of these off to simplify it. Here's our countries that have a lower income but net migration gain. Yes, Southern Europe, generally speaking, isn't as wealthy as Northern Europe, but Southern Europe is much more wealthy than Northern Africa, which is wealthier than Sub-Saharan Africa. And all of a sudden, just by changing the scale, you have changed very much the things that the peoples can see. We realize now actually that the migration into Southern Europe is as much about the migrants crossing over here from Africa. So let's go into Northern Africa. Let's have a little bit more of a look. And I want to turn on here. Just bear with me a second. Uh, yeah, so countries in Africa that are transit and origin countries. So the, these are the areas in Sub-Saharan Africa where you're getting most out migration. And uh, these are the transit countries, the countries that the, that the migrants are mostly moving through in order to get to North um, into um, Europe here. So what I want to do is to turn on these and show the main migrant routes. And I can turn on some information about countries in um, Africa. Now what I'm able to do then is to come in and pull in a couple of examples. Here we have Senegal, for example. Um, Senegal I chose because it's a very good example of emigration related to economic factors. So I was able to pull in some information here about the, the Senegalese um, culture which basically celebrates um, immigrants in the way that we celebrate entrepreneurs. It's demonstrated amongst other things in the Senegalese pop songs in which the migrant is celebrated as a modern hero. So this is your economic migration and I'm able to link through from that to some other factors. Here is your Senegal population pyramid. Uh, can we see the classic shape of that population pyramid? Can we see the impact that um, migration might have had there. But of course, how often do we want to say to our students over and over again, Africa is a continent, not a country. So not every country in Sub-Saharan Africa has migration happening for the same reasons. Why don't we come over here to Eritrea? Why don't you try this with your GCSE pupils? Uh, most of mine, in fact, oh, none of them had ever even heard of the country of Eritrea. Um, Try that whenever you get back, see how many of them know it. But what we can look here is something of the push factors. Now, 
this this is done with their GCSE pupils. Um, that's blocked it because I'm signed in with my school account. But I'm able to link through videos there that show them some of the real challenges and the difficulties that are happening here in Eritrea. Uh, and in particular, where do you see this? This is very, very striking. You, you'll know, of course, that um, the, the forced conscription of young men especially is a major, major issue here uh, and that this is a country that has massive amounts of out migration. Now look at this, look at the question you can ask them about this population pyramid. Is this starting to go into stage three in that uh, stage three of DTM in that the base is no longer expanding? It seems unlikely given the economic context. You can begin to look at the impacts of migration there. You can begin to look at the impacts of the out-migration of that age group, the group that's conscripted, and the impacts that's having on the birth rate as a result of that. Really powerful stories that can be told through that whole narrative. So two examples there, one of economic migration, one of uh, asylum seekers, and then the routes that they can take through. And again, because this is a GIS map, we can change the base map the journey through sub-Saharan Africa. My goodness, just simply to zoom in there and get a sense of that landscape on its own is powerful. And the stories you can tell there of people trafficking um, and again, some really powerful images and videos that you can use to support that. Measure that distance, two and a half thousand kilometers across the Sahara Desert. How far would that take you? Well, if I go to my school in Lurgan and go two and a half thousand kilometers, how far will that take us, folks? How far? Where would you travel? Do you fancy traveling across that distance, being people are smuggled? Uh, and then the story goes on. We can take them up here to North Africa, to Quetta, uh, which I'm sure you'll know is one of the Spanish um, settlements there. And I've got some amazing footage there of the uh, immigrants trying to get across the fences there, the physical barriers. Uh, we can come across here to uh, the detention center in um, Syria and there, again I have linked there through to some powerful videos showing the experiences that the people, uh, the, the migrants have as they go across. Really just trying to build in that empathy. The journey then across the Mediterranean Sea, more opportunities there to look at the dangers and the challenges that exist with that. Uh, videos that are built in and the powerful story and the narrative that you can build through that as we come all the way up here to the UK. Now, we are into the realm of politics here. As I say to my students when I'm teaching this, you of course are entitled to your own opinion on, on migration. You absolutely are. You're not entitled to your own facts though. And I will always say to them, it's not my job to tell you what to think, but it is absolutely my job to inform you about the realities of this experience. So this whole journey that these people have gone on as they've traveled across those distances and they arrive in the UK and this image now, <laughs> yep, we're into interesting territory learning to politics here. This image takes on a whole new meaning whenever we take them through that journey. It's absolutely not my job to tell my students what to think. Absolutely not. But it is absolutely my job to inform them of the stories behind each one of those faces in that poster. If that poster is going to be used for that purpose, I want to educate them. I want to illuminate them. I want to show them the reality. So there is a little bit of an insight as to how that can be a teach from the front tool. Um, so hopefully what you've seen through this is why I would do this. Why do I bother using GIS? It helps me do geography better, basically. <laughs> you've seen what the GIS can do. Um, not too much of the how yet, but I, I'm convinced that if, if you're really going to be interested in using GIS, and investing, because it will take some investment, you really need to know why it's worthwhile and what are some of the things you want to do. So if I have in any way at all succeeded in getting you interested, do you want to learn more? 
Well, here is the offer for you because we're running a great British and Irish GIS Rivers initiative at the moment. Um, if I could ask either Brendan or Andy, if, if you have the link available, Andy, could you put it into the chat for us there? If you would like to sign up to learn a little bit more, what we've got here is basically a citizen science project that we're trying to get people to use their local knowledge of rivers in their areas um, and go and just on their daily walk, collect some information about the rivers and then using survey one two three just like you did right at the very start of this session so it's not really anything more challenging than what you did right at the start but then it will produce a, a map for you similar to some of the maps that you've seen i've already done this with my local river and this is an example of some of the things that my students have been able to do based on the investigations that they have done using this GIS map. So if you would like to find out a little bit more about that, uh, we would love to in invite you to be involved in this initiative. And it's a, a very, very easy on ramp, but it can unleash some really powerful geography for you. So overcoming the Lisnagunya effect, there's a little bit of a sense for you today about how I use GIS to turn space into place. Thank you all very much indeed.